Well, good morning once again. If you're just joining us online or you just joined us since our service has started, thank you so much for being here. My name is Jack. I'm one of our pastors here at the Creek, and I am so excited uh, to be with you today and to speak. <laughs> I may be excited about what I'm going to speak to you about. I'll uh, clarify that in just a minute. Uh, but I want to welcome in all of our campuses that are coming to hang out with us for Williamsburg. We love you down there. Somerset, we love you. Uh, we love everything that's going on there at, with our group in Bell County. So thank you so much for hanging out. Uh, if you've not been here over the past few weeks, we have been in a series on the church, and we've been looking at the church uh, and looking at the reasons behind why we do what we do. It's always good just to kind of have some realignment and resettling to be reminded of why we do what we do. And we have a mission here at the church, and we get that mission from Jesus' words that we find in Matthew 28, uh, where he says, go into all the world, baptizing them, making disciples. And we term it around here as loving God and loving people. So we kind of take the great commission and the golden rule, we kind of merge it together because at the end of the day, that's what God wants us to be. And we take it a little bit of a step further with our vision. And here at the Creek, we've always wanted to say we want to be a place or a church where people who really don't like church love to attend. And I love that about our church because uh, I really do believe that we try to always keep that in the forefront in order to make a place where people from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, from all different circumstances, to be able to have a place to come come in and be able to sit at a table with Jesus and hopefully have a clean and clear and a fair conversation with him because at the end of the day, it's really uh, what we do with Jesus uh, in our lives is what makes a difference. And so uh, the last three weeks we have done that. I want to encourage you again to go back and watch our last series, uh, last three weeks of the series because our pastors have done a great job talking about our core values. And in those uh, weeks, um, I believe to some degree today, the core value I want to talk to you about, the values that really well up in us that we show up is something we see everywhere, but it's something that don't normally love to talk about because I know what I do and I know what you do when we talk about it. But this is the value day and it's this. And it's generosity changes lives. I really believe that. I believe generosity's changed my life. But I know some of us, <laughs> we're talking about money again. That's what we just thought. And I have to say that. That's sometimes what creeps in with me. And, uh, and on the things that I would rather talk about, and my two teenagers are here in the room this morning, I would probably rather have the talk with them than maybe do this sometimes. You know what I mean? Uh, it might be just a little bit easier to have the talk with them. Uh, but we're going to talk about it today because generosity really is the heart of God and it really is what he does in us and through us and for us that really makes a difference in our lives. So this value is a little bit unique though. It's a little bit unique to me because it's a value that I believe that, that we find in all aspects of the church, but I also believe that it has a friend, somebody that's kind of tandem with it. And it has a connection with another word of great value. Uh, you know there are some great duos in this world, right? So I think about my childhood when I think about some duos because you can't really have one of these without the other. And when I was growing up and when I was a child, you know, Bert and Ernie was a big deal. I love Bert and Ernie. Uh, it was a big deal, but I also love Tom and Jerry. I kind of wish we had some old cartoons back, although I saw some of that the other day. Probably don't need to watch Tom and Jerry too much in 2024. Uh, but when you think about great duos, uh, you think about C-3PO and R2-D2, or maybe Chewbacca and Han Solo. Or maybe you grew up in my generation, the first to have the NES, and you think about Mario and Luigi in a different way. Now, if you grew up around my house, you would know that we love Top Gun, so you can't really think about duos without thinking about Goose and Maverick, right? And uh, my wife loves it when we watch it because I always remind her that Goose dies and she hates it when I say that. But when I was growing up at my home, my mother and my dad, they would play music and oftentimes it would be things like the Righteous Brothers. Hey. Oh, somebody's <laughs> about to have a moment. One of my favorite country duos of all time, Brooks and Dunn. A little boot scootin' boogie. But I always have these images burned in my head from my childhood of seeing Sonny and Cher, the Carpenters, Simon and Garfunkel. In the 90s, it would have been the rap group Outkast. Sorry, I'm letting you in on my life a little bit, but really, honestly, when I think about great duos of all time, these are the two I think of. The late Kitty Rogers and Dolly Parton. <laughs> because, you know, there's some islands in the stream. That's what we are, all right? That'll be, my, that'll be my video so that I can get on the worship team, but that's probably not gonna happen either. <laughs> but great duos, right? Well, one of the driving forces and one of the driving values is it's the heart of our church is part of a duo. The first part of that is obviously generosity. And generosity simply is the spirit and the action of freely and frequently giving to others. It really is an irrational giving when it comes to the dichotomy of God's world. It's giving more than you should. It's moving farther beyond what you're comfortable with sometimes. 
A matter of fact, the scripture says, in Hebrews 13, 16, it says it like this, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, that's where God is pleased. But you really can't get to generosity without also having this, and that's this word here, gratitude. Gratitude. And gratitude for us simply means thanks and appreciation. If you want to look through it through a biblical lens, it means extending favor towards. And for somebody that feels like they've been saved, God has really extended favor towards me because I know the guy that I look at in the mirror all the time. I know the guy that I walk around with and have most of the conversations with. God has really extended a lot of favor towards me, so I'm very grateful for it. And when we talk about gratitude, we're talking about giving grace and kindness. And Paul writes this, so you will be enriched in every way so that you can be what? Somebody tell me. Say it again. On every occasion and through us, you're, oh, you're catching on. We'll result in what? They go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. When we think about generosity, oftentimes we think about what we've been given or what we have. But we really are talking about the gifts that God's given us. You think about today. You woke up right now. You have time. He's given you time. And if you're like me, sometimes I feel like I squander a lot of time, but he's given us time. He's given us time because that's life. We're breathing. We woke up this morning and we're breathing. We're upright and we have a chance at life and the connections in which we have. He's given you talents. This morning, we got to be led by some incredibly talented people from our stage. But you also don't know about the talent that's going on back in Kids Creek and the talent that exists behind the scenes and in these rooms you can't see that's operating all of our technology and helping us to move beyond this room and broadcasting to other campuses and broadcasting to the world. There's a lot of talent involved. And not only that, when you come to faith, he gives you another set of gifts. We call those spiritual gifts. And then you obviously have the treasure, your money, your resources. <laughs> And James says this, that everything that God gives us, every good and perfect gift, he gives. The psalmist would say in Psalm 36, verse 1, to give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. You see, generosity and gratitude, they live in a cycle with each other. It's a positive feedback loop. It's a loop that impacts one another. You can't really have one without the other because if you have generosity first, it should lead to gratitude. And gratitude should also lead to more generosity. So it creates this positive feedback loop. And these things are evidence that God wants to do something in you and through you and for me and through me. So let me tell you about how I kind of really started thinking about generosity years ago. In 1999... I had an opportunity that was put before me. Somebody was being very generous to me to offer to take me, a poor kid, <laughs> 22, on a mission trip with them to Ukraine. I was terrified. If I'm honest, I'm just going to go ahead and cut to it. I was terrified. I'd never been on an airplane before. I had all kinds of whatever. I grew up in a family where my dad was a little whatever about thinking about an airplane. Uh, but, but I was terrified. And the first plane I'm going to get on, I'm going to fly for... Not a little quick hour hop. I'm going to go for hours and be stuck in this thing and not know what the experience was like. As a matter of fact, I was so terrified by it that I was very intentional about saying, okay, I'll go on the trip weeks after the deadline had occurred. Little did I know the person that was, being generos uh, that was showing me generosity to take me on it would call me back and say, I've called our leaders. There's a spot for you. You're going. And I was like, oh, man, that didn't work out. What am I going to do now? But I went. And then on that first trip, on my first flight, I go down uh, into Europe to make our first landing. And something happens to me that I've never experienced before. My ears popped in a way they've never popped. And for the next 12 days, I had a sinus infection. And I didn't even know that that was a thing at that point. Couldn't breathe during the day. I was thankful, thankful, thankful that we had some nurses in this group of 80 people that were on the trip. And they had this brand new drug called Flonase. And Flonase saved my life that one, on that trip. <laughs> had never heard of that before. But I was on the trip, and what I found out when I was making excuses that I can't speak the language, that I can't communicate, I wouldn't know how to live, I'm just a guy from Southeast Kentucky, what am I doing? Going to a country I have no business going to, that I know nothing about, you can imagine the excuses that ran through the head. But I went, and, they, and it was a choir trip. 
I was not in the choir. Uh, but we had things that we would do throughout the day. We would be on teams of about 35, and we would go into orphanages, and we would engage with orphans, and many of those orphans would literally, we would be there on days where kids were just getting dropped off one after another for whatever circumstances were in the parents' lives. And I'd never seen anything like this in my life. I would see some of our team members who were moms and dads who understood life a little bit better than my 22-year-old self. They would grab these kids and hold them and console them because all they were doing was crying because their world had been flipped up and turned upside down in a moment. But I worked on our recreation side of those teams. And when I was on these teams, uh, what we would do is we would play games, generally outside. But one particular day, we were in a city and we were in an urban context. And so we went to this orphanage in a little bit of a high-rise building. So we had to stay inside, and it was hot. Uh, air conditioners were not a thing, and so it was hot. And one of the things that I immediately noticed while we were preparing our stuff and modifying what we would usually do to be able to play with these kids, because you never knew what age the kids were that were coming in, but this day they were all toddlers, preschoolers, kindergartners, first graders, that age. And they all began to walk in the back of this big room, and they had two things is all they had. They had on their underwear, they had no clothes on because it was so hot. They had on a little red hat, every one of them, and they carried a little wooden chair. And unbelievable, I don't know how they did this, but those kids sat in rows without being told. Uh, young kids knew what to do when they came in. And so one of the things that we would do as part of our team was preparing to do stories with them and to do skits and to do some other things. Those of us that could do nothing else, we walked around with candy and stickers. And we handed out candy and we gave away stickers and put little stickers on them or on their hats or on their legs or whatever. Well, when we leave that day out of that orphanage, we're walking down the street and one of our interpreters is walking near where I'm at. And one of our, one of our uh, other team members says, I don't understand what was just happening back there. He said, what do you mean? He goes, well, when we were cleaning up to leave, some of the kids were free to kind of run around. And look at our legs. And a bunch of us had four or five stickers back on our legs that they had taken off themselves and put on us. And for this person asking the question, they couldn't understand why these kids who had nothing was giving back what little bit they had in stickers. And the interpreter was quick to say, in our culture, when you give, you give back. That's the way we show gratitude, and that's the way it works. And I learned a lesson that day something that I just didn't know that I wouldn't understand because I didn't fully understand generosity or the gravity of it and how to be thankful for it. But this is what I learned that day, that generosity towards others builds authentic confidence in you. There was something happening for me where God was showing up in a different way. You see, what happens to us when we don't put ourselves in situations to where we give and we don't put ourselves in situations to where we lean in or serve, here's what we do. If we're in our normal everyday life, we can never discover really what all God has given us and how he's built us to serve. And you cannot do that without experience or, as we love to talk about in the church world, take a step of faith and do something about it. You, you see, whenever you begin to discover just what all God has gifted you with, all of a sudden, you have a newfound confidence that you never had before. At nights during these concerts, I thought, well, we'll carry all the instrumental equipment, all that around. No, I didn't know that there was a team of Ukrainians that were loading it up every day in buses and taking it ahead of us, and all we had to do was show up. So I learned a couple of Ukrainian phrases. I will not uh, try to say that today because I would not know if I would say it or articulate it correctly or what the word would be that actually would come out, and I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, but I would stand at these huge concert halls that people, this is 10 years outside of communism, they would just fill them. And all we would do is hand them a program and basically say, good evening, glad you're here. And we would watch people full of gratitude because there was a few people that decided to come and spend a little of their time with them. But what I had learned is that when you take a step forward, even when it's uncomfortable, that God will build a confidence in you. And that can only come from the generosity and the gifting in which you discover in yourself when you take a step forward. So gratitude continues to work itself out. It's not just a thank you and you're done. God will continue to do something in you and through you and for you. Why? Because he wants to do for the people that are around you. You see, at the end of the day, this is what I was learning. The generosity really grounds us in our faith. It grounds us in our faith. Our gifts, what we have, no matter the amount. You know what usually happens for us as human beings, and I find myself having these conversations all the time, I want more. Sometimes I'm never satisfied with what I have, and I just want more. 
It often drives us when we get something to want more. And sometimes that crosses a line to where we become really selfish and we turn inward. And we do that, when we do that, we're, we're really kind of not facing towards God and what he would have for us. And really what we have, what we have just proves, here's what, here's what we have proves, that God entrusts us with some stuff. He entrusts you and I with gifts to help everyone else. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel this way. You ever feel like you just don't have enough? There's been moments in my life where I feel like I just don't have enough. I could use some more money. I could use a little bit more savings. I, I could use a new car. I got a one that's almost 16. I could use another car. There's things that keep coming, and you've got to be careful because at the end of the day, generosity and gratitude, here's what they are. They're the anecdote to our human problem. 1 John 2.16 says that for everything, for everything in the world, the lust of your flesh, the lust of your eyes, the pride of your life, it comes not from the Father, but from the world. And so that's what we've got to be careful about. Almost everything that we struggle with, fall short of, or let's use the word, we sin, it can fall into one of those three buckets. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And gifts, you know, when we get gifts, when we get treasure, we often think about what's mine, what's ours, what's mine, and we hold on. And what I found out in my life, when I've been given more stuff, there's a pressure that comes with it. There's a pressure to maintain that treasure, that gift, especially when we tell ourselves that I worked hard for it, I created it, I own it, I earned it, I, I, I. So this is where it came in for me, understanding finally what the tithe really meant. You know, the scripture had taught a tithe. The tithe really was 10%. It was a first fruit giving is what it was. It was to be reminded that there's a God that's for us that provides for us. And that because of all the provision he's given, that what I do first is show him thanks. It's gratitude. What does that do? It helps me to prevent all the other things that get in the way when I think it's mine, mine, mine. Because it's important to remember where our things come from. How we use our gifts, they show what we value. How you use your time, how you use your calendar, how you use your own personal giftings, how you use your treasure, it shows what we value. You see, gratitude and generosity, it shifts our understanding. It moves it up away from us onto him. From God, sometimes this is what kind of bothers me in the church sometimes, <clears throat> is really we always just think about God and what more can he give me? What more can you give me? What more can you pour out for me? And that really does turn us into being selfish. And when we do that, what we end up doing is we start losing a little bit of connection with him because you're not communicating in the right direction. How many times have you heard about relationships or marriages or jobs that went south because people quit communicating and quit talking? When it becomes about you instead of about the whole or when it becomes about you and something else slips in, you've got to be very careful about that. And God has put some things in place for us to just be reminded of how life really is. You know, we are made like him. And here's the thing. God doesn't exist just to give us. He built us to work. And this is not always something that's fun to talk about in Christianity because, you know, we're also built to rest. And we don't want to work too much. But he's built us to work. We are made to engage the place in where we live, our communities, our hotspots. We are made to show love. And you may say to yourself, but all these things happen with my power and my strength, and they happen with my hands. But is that really true? Deuteronomy 8.18 says this, or 8.17 says, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. Now, what's going on here is that there's been a little bit of wandering, and God's been providing this thing called manna. And there's a little bit of complaining about the thing called manna, and they're, they're wanting to go back, they're wanting to go back, they're wanting to go back, but he's, he's going to talk to them. He's going to say, hey, but hey, your power and your strength of your hands, you say they produce wealth for me? But, but remember, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, He's given you the ability to do what you do. <clears throat> Wealth is not bad. By the way, money's not bad. Your talents aren't bad. 
And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors, it is today. That he's made us to produce. He's made us to have. <clears throat> those things aren't bad. As a matter of fact, all those things are neutral in and of themselves. What makes them one way or the other is what you do with them. You see, we get, to get disconnected from God when we let greed and envy slip in and take over. When we slide into that attitude, we want more, we need more. And here's the thing that always gets me, <coughs> excuse me, is fear. The fear that if I give away, I just don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can. I don't know if I'll be able to pay the bills. I don't know if I'll be able to do it, be able to do it. Just keep going. You just start rambling off excuse after excuse. We let fear create the thought cycle. Let's hold on. We can't afford it right now. I'm not a smart man. I really don't know how a light bulb works really in and of itself, and I really don't know how electricity works. But I know if I have a lamp, and I put a light bulb in it, and turn on the switch, and it's not working, there's at least one more thing I know I can do, and that's to take the cord that's attached to the light and plug it into the outlet. Now, I couldn't tell you how the electricity got to the outlet or if, if it's even there, but if the light comes on, I know it works. And sometimes, for me, I reason myself out of generosity because I want to know the whys and the hows and, and everything about it. But if I'm honest, I need to treat it just like the lamp. I just want the bulb to work and I want the power to come through to make the bulb to work so that I can see. And what happens when we let selfishness and greed and apathy and laziness to creep in? What we do is we start disconnecting from our power source. And let me just say this, if God created you in his image to do good works and he sent his son to die for you, to redeem you, then isn't he the God that wants to bless you with even more? You see, really the tithe, what I learned, it was just a 10% re return on his investment in me. It was just a start. Why? Because it's my first start in taking a step forward to relying on God for the next step in my life. For the next step in my life for the next step in my life. Really what we do in being generous to one another, we do it because one, we love God and because of what he's done for us is now an overflow because he wants to use us to make a difference in people's lives. This is why the church is important. Because at the end of the day, what we, you and I have to do, whether we love it or not, is we have to learn to rely on God because that's where our faith comes from. That's where our next step comes from. <clears throat> that's where him helping with our plans and our future and our purpose comes from. And here's what happens when you begin to give. And this is the one that, that, that I'm still learning, but it's been so clear over the years. I'm not owned by my money. I'm not owned by my time. And I'm not owned by fill in the blank. Because when you do that and you're plugged into the power source and you have a connection with him, if you don't believe, here it is, if you don't believe that God is over and owns the 100%, you won't give God your best 10%. You see, fear comes when you are not connected to the source. And when things don't own you anymore, then you can look to the one who owns everything, God, and he will give graciously to you. You see, fear comes when we're not connected. I have learned that I need to be grateful and generous in all circumstances. I've learned that I need to be connected to the source of Jesus Christ, that I need to know him, that I need to walk with him, that I need to take steps with him because he's provided all things. Because here at the end of the day, this is what I know. Generosity, it'll deepen your life with him. You see, money and wealth is not the enemy. The love of it is. If you engage with generosity and thankfulness, you and I, we will help make the world a better place. These things will expand our life, our influence, and opportunities. When you engage with generosity and with gratitude, you will expand your life, you will expand your influence, and you will expand your opportunities. You know why? Because I heard a pastor talk a long time ago that he decided one day to take God at his real word, and he began each year to incrementally increase and give. And he's at around 90% now. He's at 90% giving. And he said, God just kept giving me more. He said, you know why I, I finally understood God kept giving me more? Because he could trust me with the little. And that's what God's wanting to do. He's wanting to use you and me. He's wanting to use us collectively as the church to be a conduit of his grace and his mercy for a lost and dying world. So 
So if you want your life to expand and if you want your influence to expand and you want your opportunities to expand, you gotta have a, have a heart of gratitude and you gotta have a value of generosity. In 2 Corinthians, there is a, a story given and the story is built around farming. So for all you that farm, you'll know what I'm talking about. For us that don't farm, <laughs> We love what you make. Uh, we love it. But this is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It says, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously, they will reap generously. Each man, they should give what he has decided in his heart to give, but not reluctantly. And don't do it under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. See, God is able to make all grace abound to you. So then at all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work as it is written. He has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now, it says, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food will also supply and increase your store of seed. And what will he do? He will enlarge your harvest through your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity result in thanksgiving to God because this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Generosity and gratitude is really for us to be more the hands and feet of God. It's really for us not to get caught and not active and not making a difference in people's lives in and around us. Because at the end of the day, when we stop doing the work and we let laziness or apathy, which is worse, creep in, then we start to lose our connection with our Lord and with our Savior. You see, what defines a generous person is that they are. It is not what we do. It's not something we do. It's who we are. It's who God is. He is generous. He is grateful. He is kind. And here's what I want to challenge you with. <clears throat> Some of you, the finances aren't your, your roadblock. It's serving. It's doing. For some of us, it is the finances and we just got to turn loose to wherever. I'm not even saying give it here, although we would love for you to give it here because we believe in what we do here as a church. You see, you're gifted to create. You are gifted to work. We are not gifted to sit on our hands and be idle. Once you know you're gifted and you can work and you can create, then generosity will become one of the greatest gifts you'll ever do in your life. I don't know of a generous person that doesn't have more joy. They're not more hopeful, they're more hopeful. They're more kind, they're more compassionate. And honestly, they just, when you get around them, they're more alive than anyone you'll ever meet. Because generosity at the end of the day, it changes lives. And people that are generous have understood that their lives have been changed forever. We've been given an incredible gift by God. Ephesians talks about grace being a gift of God. There's so much inside of you, so much left in you. But I don't care what your age is in here today, you're watching online, there's so much more to you than what you already know. And it's not just God's gifts in you, that's for others, but they are also for you. But he's gonna use you to reach others. You see, God's been very generous to us. So our question this morning is, what are you grateful for? Where's your gratitude? You say, well, I'm not sure. Well, let me help you with a few of them. Here's just some things God has given us. Number one, he's given us the gift of life. He's given us this incredible thing of life that we can live with one another and engage with one another. We can love one another and we can have relationships. And I wanna get into some of that. But when we messed up, he didn't stop there. He gave us the gift of salvation. He said, that's all right. We may have messed up. 
My son's gonna take care of it for you. He's gonna give his life so that you can have life and live it to the fullest. He's given you the gift of the Holy Spirit. He didn't leave us there either. He said, while you still live on the side of heaven, I know you're gonna have your struggles, so I'm gonna give you the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. Your paraclete, the inner worker, the one that wants to help, your helpmate. I will be with you until the end of the age, Jesus says. He's given you the gift of love, to choose, to love one another, to love each other, to make a difference. What a gift, the gift of creation. I mean, think about it. We sit on a rock suspended in the middle of time and space. And God's created a vast, incredible place that we live in that not only sustains our life, gives us beauty to look at, provides materials for us to live and to dive into the image that we've been made in. Do you know that we're created by God in his image? And guess what we do? We create. You ever thought about it? Men one day looked around and said, those birds are flying. Let's figure out how to put wings on something. All those fish are in the water. Let's figure out how we can get down there with them. We're made in the image of God to do great things. So creation just cries out to the one true God. We've been given this incredible gift to choose. You know, when you got up this morning, you chose to come here. Grateful. To choose love, to choose kindness, to choose what's correct, to choose God. You've been given the gift of relationships. We are built for that. To be connected to God is the utmost important relationship, but out of that flows all of our incredible ones. I can't imagine a world without my wife or my kids, my friends, you, my church. We've been given an incredible gift for relationships, wisdom, knowledge, giving you the ability to think, to create, to make decisions, to have conversations, purpose. You know what we're all looking for? You see, when we get busy with generosity and gratitude, guess what starts bubbling to the surface? You start seeing exactly how God's made you and built you. I still can't believe that I get to do what I get to do. I had no idea. It took me six and a half years to get out of college. It's not because I'm thinking that I couldn't get out in four. I just didn't know what in the heck to do with my life. And then Jesus changed that. He's given us the gift of peace. You have the ability to restore of joy. Happiness can be fleeting, but joy comes in the morning. <laughs> Eternal life, you don't have to worry about it anymore. God has you. I will never leave you or I will never forsake you. No one can steal you out of the palm of my hand, Jesus says. And then when we're saved, we get this incredible gift of spiritual gifts to use with one another to help people take steps in their life. And maybe one of those gifts that gets enhanced for you is through the lens of generosity and being grateful. And we have this, and I think it's one of the most neglected things we have. God has given you a way into his heart and to his life to see him, to watch him, to know what he wants for us. He left behind an incredible love letter for you and me to dive in, to get to know the very nature of he who gives everything. And at the end of the day, this is what I know. I know that these gifts demonstrate God's love for us, that while we were yet sinners, he would die for us. Because he desires to have a deep abiding relationship with you and with me. These gifts are not only for our benefit, but they're to share with others. When you share, when you give, when you engage. The scripture would teach us that when we serve other people, we're serving the very heart of God. See, when we show God's generosity and grace in the world, it makes a difference. You see, this is what it does. Generosity. It expresses gratitude. Gratitude will inspire more generosity. And then generosity will cultivate a grateful heart, creating a cycle of blessing for people to come. You see, generosity and gratitude, they're not something we do. It's who we are. 
And when we realize that nothing that we have is really ours, that we're stewards of what God has given us, then it makes a difference in how we use what God's given us, whether it's our time, our talents, our treasures. We should learn to be givers and not takers, to be contributors and not consumers. We are made at the end of the day to work, to create, to give, to be generous. And when we do that, what you're gonna find out, you're gonna be blessed more than you could ever dream or imagine. You're gonna have more joy and more hope and more kindness and more compassion. And you're gonna be more alive than ever before. I do think about these things from time to time and they are philosophical, but I think about when my life's done on this side of heaven and just what we've done in the church. I'm wondering who I'm gonna meet on the other side whose faith and generosity led to me finding faith. And then who's gonna say thank you when what we did in generosity, but collectively we're all gonna to get together and give thanks to the one who is above all things and for all things. You see, you've been given these gifts by God and there's so much still left inside of you and me. And it's not just God's gift to you, it's to be used to reach others. God wants to do something in you and me and through you and me. And that is what generosity and gratitude has at its heart because it's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your grace, for your kindness, for your mercy. God, I'm grateful for your generosity to create us so that we could have relationships and have connection. I thank you for when we fell short, you gave your son to be a sacrifice so that we could have life and live it to the fullest. Lord, I pray that our church would be known for our generosity. And I pray that in that, that would be known for the kindness in which we show people and give to people and to help people because that is who you are. God, thank you for being a God that loves us cares for us. Lord, if there's anyone online or in our rooms today, in our campuses, that has never asked you to be their Lord and Savior, then today, Lord, I pray that today would be a day of salvation for them. That they would just ask you that you would give freely your salvation and your love. That they would ask for you to save them. And maybe that's you here today and you would love to do that. You can do that by simply just saying, God, you're generous and I need your love. Thank you for giving your life so that I could have life. Thank you for saving me. Please save me. You are my Lord and my Savior. God, today I pray if anyone prayed that prayer that they found you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that today they would let someone know. And God, I pray that today we would walk out of here being more gracious and generous than ever before. I pray that you would help us to engage and find out who you've made us to be. Lord, give us the confidence that we need to be the people of faith that you've called us to be. Help us to do good works so that in doing so, more people will find the name that is above all names and his name is Jesus. And all God's people said,